and the start of our review, I will discuss Chapter 1 to 4 of the Plan Education, examination and diagnosis of blood encephalopathy. No, wala lagi. Medyo bungol ang audio po, Dok. Kung saan siya, Dok? Mag... Dapat mag Dili ko dapat mag-unmute. Ay, mag-mute. Yung with audio, katong option ko sa baba, Beb. Uh, saan ni Dok? Kanan, di ba, na-share option sa baba sa Zoom. Uh-oh. na i-box na, na kailangan mo i- di ba ka na portion of the screen blah 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 i-click na small box sa ah, low- share sound oh yes yes Mano. tapos ah. i-repeat ni mo i-close ni mo na yung mga ano tapos i-repeat ni mo o share share screen Mac Express <laughs> Sadyo di ay ni kauras Udok, then cut na ni siya. <laughs> Dili, wala. Ano, <laughs> brief lang akong uban. Brief pa ang one hour sa iya. Ha, hi. Gusto ko dito ko dito magtabay, Dok. Kaya mamiss din mo. Malalaki yung button ka pa. Tutsyo, ang imo one hour. Sige, sige, Beb. Sige, Dok. Good morning, doctors. Today, Anong ganda? Today, the first day of our Kaplan Club. In the start of our review, I will discuss Chapter 1.1 of Kaplan 12 edition, the examination and diagnosis of volume the application. So the, the psychiatric interview is the most crucial element in the evaluation and care of persons with mental health. A significant purpose of the initial psychiatric interview is to obtain information that will establish a criteria-based diagnosis. Let's begin with the general principles. First is to have an agreement as to the process. So the psychiatrist will introduce herself, have a consent for the interview, explain the nature of the interaction as well as the duration. The crucial issue here if the patient was brought in voluntarily, and that should be established. Next is to have a privacy and to maintain confidentiality, except for what needs to be shared with the remaining referring physician or the treatment team. So the interviewer should make every attempt to ensure that others cannot overhear the content of the interview. If, dip- if difficult, attempt to use different place for the interview. If not feasible, specific topics may be avoided and indicate that these issues may be discussed later when privacy can be ensured. Next is to have respect and consideration. This will contribute then to the development of the rapport. This is defined as an harmonious responsiveness of the physician to the patient and the patient to the physician. Well, empathy is an understanding of what the patient is thinking and feeling. So we may use empathic response or nonverbal cues such as leaning towards or leaning forward, nodding, and putting down one's pen. Ingredient in empathy is retaining objectivity. Maintaining objectivity is a crucial is crucial in a therapeutic relationship and it differentiates empathy from identification. So with identification, psychiatrists not only understand the emotion but also experience it to the extent that they lose the ability to be objective. Identification can also be draining to the psychiatrist and that would lead to disengagement and ultimately burnout. Next is a, phys- is a patient-physician relationship. This is the core practice of medicine, but the order is sometimes reversed to reinforce that the treatment should always be patient-centered. So this is to demonstrate that the physician understands what the patient is stating and emoting. Because patient's willingness to share is increased or decreased depending on the verbal and often the nonverbal interventions of the physician and the other staff. It is also used to recognize by the patient that the, that the doctor cares. 
The patient comes to the interview seeking for help. Even in those instances when the patient arrives on the insistence of others, assistance may be sought by the patient. So this desire for help motivates the patient to share with the stranger information and feelings that are distressing, personal, and often private. The sharing is reinforced by a non-judgmental attitude and behavior. So being able to share the, your thoughts and feelings with a non-judgmental listener is generally a positive experience. The genuineness of the physician also reinforces this patient-physician relationship. So being able to laugh in response to a humorous comment, admit a mistake, or apologize for an error that inconvenienced inconvenience the patient also strengthens the therapeutic alliance. It is also essential to be flexible in the interview and also responsive to the patient's initiatives. Next is the conscious and the unconscious. In the interview, transfer, transference and countertransference are very significant expressions of unconscious process. Transference is when the patient unconsciously displays to the doctor, while the countertransference is that the doctor will unconsciously displays um, the experience to the patient. Resistances are the processes, conscious or unconscious, that would interfere with the therapeutic objectives of treatment which may take many different forms, including exaggerated emotional responses, intellectualization, generalization, missed appointments, or acting out behavior. So in inset-oriented psychotherapy, interpretations are interventions that undo the process of repression and allow the unconscious thoughts and feelings to come to awareness so they can be handled. Next is the person-centered and disorder-based interviews. A psychiatric interview should be person or patient-centered. That is, the focus should be on understanding the patient and enabling the patient to tell his or her story. So this is also not, uh, it is only not, it is only, it is not only the history that should be person-centered. The resulting treatment plan must also be based on the patient's goal and not on the psychiatrist's goal. The patient should be explicitly encouraged to identify his or her goals and aspirations in his or her own words. So a person-centered approach focuses on strengths and assets as well as the deficits. Safety and comfort. So safety must be assessed and that is to inquire for the patient's comfort. So the interview may need to be shortened or quickly terminated if the patient becomes more agitated and threatening. Then for the time and the number of sessions, for an initial interview, 45 to 90 minutes are generally allotted. For inpatients or, a medic or on a medical unit or at times for confused patients, in considerable distress or psychotic, the length of time that can be tolerated in one sitting may be 20 to 30 minutes or less. In those instances, several brief sessions may be necessary. Even for patients who can tolerate longer sessions, more than one session may be required to complete an evaluation. These are the elements of the initial psychiatric interview, and we will go through it one by one. First is to have an identifying data. It should be very brief, about one or two sentences only. And it typ typically includes the name, the age, sex, the marital status, the race, or the ethnicity, as well as the occupation. Then is this, next will be the source and reliability. This is where the information has come from. It is where the assessment of how reliable the data are. Then the chief complaint. It is, when, it is where the patient's presenting complaint ideally in his or her own words. Example, I am depressed or have a lot of anxiety. anxiety. Next is the history of present illness. It is a chronologic description of the evolution of the symptoms of the current episode. It is also the changes that have occurred during this same period. The length of time that the current symptoms have been, pres have been present. 
it is also where the presence or absence of the stressors as well as the triggering factors. Important factors that elevate or exacerbate the symptoms can also be found here. Essential questions such as, such as what, how much, how long, and associated factors must also be included, as well as the treatment initiated and the psychiatric ROS to help us rule in or rule out. So this is just um, a guide on what to ask for during the psychiatric ROS. So when we would like to um, establish or explore more on the mood symptoms, we can ask for the sadness, the tearfulness, sleep, appetite, energy, etc. for the depression. And for the mania, the impulsivity, grandiosity, recklessness, excessive energy. And also for the anxiety, um, the generalized anxiety symptoms. So we would ask where, when, how, how long, or how frequent the symptoms present, as well as the panic disorder symptoms, obsessive compulsive symptoms, the post-traumatic, social anxiety, and the simple phobias. Same goes with the psychosis and other types of um, psychiatric disorders, such as the ADHD and also the eating disorder symptoms. Moving on to the past psychiatric history, so these are all the psychiatric illnesses, their course, symptoms, and treatment, and also the compliance. Lethality of the history is important in the assessment of the current risk. So like the past suicidal ideation, the intent, the plans, and also the attempts. Violence and homicidality history will also include any violent actions or intent. And this should be included also in the past psychiatric history. The history of non-suicidal self-injurious behavior should also be covered. Then will be the substance use or abuse. So a non-judgmental style will elicit more accurate information. History of the use should also include which substances have been used, including the alcohol, the drugs, medications, routes of use, frequency, and amount of use. Tolerance and also withdrawal should be elicited or should be asked. And also the periods of sobriety. Then the past medical history. This accounts for the major medical illnesses and conditions as well as the treatments, both the past and the present, as well as the any as well as any past surgeries. Consideration to determine the potential causes of mental illness is one of the reasons to ask for a medical for a past medical history. So the past or the medical illnesses can also precipitate psychiatric disorder. It can mimic psychiatric disorder. It can also precipitate by the psychiatric order. Example of it, example of this is the metabolic syndrome after taking second generation antipsychotics. Then um, it it can influence also the choice of our treatment. So, for example, a patient with renal disorder, one must also uh, consider the lithium use since it can exacerbate the ongoing renal disorder of the patient. Another thing to consider is the review or include is the, the review of the non-psychiatric medications, the over-the-counter drugs, sleeping aids, herbal and alternative medications, as well as the allergies to any medications. Then for the family history, uh, this is asked because there are potential risk factors to develop such illnesses. So it, it must be a formative psychosocial background for the patient, a psychiatric diagnosis, medications, hospitalizations, substance use disorders, and lethality history should also be asked for the family history. And it is also essential in identifying potential support as well as the stresses for the patient. Next is the developmental and social history. So this will review the stages of the patient's life. It is an essential tool in determining the context of psychiatric symptoms and illnesses that may identify some of, of the significant factors in the evolution of the disorder. Next is the mental status examination. So this is the psychiatric equivalent of the PE in the rest of the medicine. 
So MSE explores all the areas of mental functioning and denotes evidence of signs and symptoms of mental illness. This will also provide the clinician with a snapshot of the patient's mental status at the time of the interview and is also useful for subsequent visits to compare and monitor the changes over time. So first is to observe the appearance and the behavior. It is the general description of the patient's looks and acts. It is a statement of patient's approach to the interview. Next is the motor activity. So it can be described as normal, slowed, or agitated. It becomes a clue to confounding neurological or medical issues also. Then, is the, then, then will be the speech. So it is uh, described whether it is described in terms of fluency, amount, the rate, the tone, as well as the volume. And then the mood, which is described as the patient's internal and sustained emotional state. Then the affect is the expression of the mood. Then the thought content. It is what the patient spontaneously expresses, as well as the responses to specific questions. Example are obsessional thoughts, compulsions, delusions, ideas of reference, paranoia, suicidality, and homicidality. While thought process is how the thoughts are formulated, organized, and expressed. Then perceptual disturbances are hallucinations, illusions, depersonalization, and derealization. Test for cognition will test the alertness, the orientation, concentration, the memory, both short and long term, the calculation, the fun of knowledge, the abstract reasoning, the insight, as well as the judgment. This is a table lifted from Kaplan, which shows us the formal thought disorders. So circumstantiality, which is an over-exclusion of trivial or relevant details that include the sense of getting to the point. So it's running around the bush. Then clang associations, it, the thoughts that thoughts are associated by the sound of words rather than by their meaning. Derailment, it's where the breakdown, uh, a breakdown in both the logical connection between ideas and the overall sense of goal-directedness. Flight of ideas is where a succession of multiple associations so the thoughts seem to be moving abruptly from one idea to another. Neologism or invention of new words. Perseveration is where the repetition of out-of-contact words, phrases, or ideas. Then tangentiality, in response to a question, the patient gives a reply that is appropriate to the general topic without actually answering the question. Thought blocking is where a sudden disruption of thought or break in the flow of ideas. Then for abstract reasoning, it's where the ability to shift back and forth between general concepts and specific um, examples. Insight, it's where the patient's understanding of how he or she is feeling presenting and functioning, as well as the potential causes of his or her psychiatric presentation. Then judgment, it's where it's the person's capacity to make good decisions and act on them. Then another element of the psychiatric interview is the physical examination. It's where, there, it's where an inclusion and extent of PE will depend on the nature and setting of the psychiatric interview. So uh, vital signs, weight, weight circumference, BMI, and height must also be um, extracted or must be measured. An abnormal involuntary movement scale or AIMS is a screening test to be followed when, when patient is using antipsychotic medication just to monitor the potential side effects such as the EPS. Then formulation, it's where the culmination of the data gathering aspect of the psychiatric interview. So formulation and diagnosis, recommendations, and treated, treatment planning can be found in this part of the interview. It is also where the brief summary of the patient's history, the presentation, and current status can be found. The biological factors, psychological factors, as well as the social factors. Moving on to the techniques used in the psychiatric interview. There are three interventions used facilitating, expanding, and obstructive interventions. 
Facilitating interventions are effective in enabling the patient to continue to share his or her story and also to promote a positive patient-doctor relationship. First is reinforcement. So a brief phrase such as, I see, go on, yes, tell me more, can be used. Then a reflection. So by using the patient's words, the psychiatrist will indicate that he or she has heard what the patient is saying and conveys an, interest, an interesting in hearing, that he or she is interested in hearing more. So it is, this response is not a question and it should not be said with a tone that is challenging or disbelieving. Next is summarizing. It is helpful to summarize what has been identified about a certain topic. This provides the opportunity for the patient to clarify or modify the psychiatrist, psychiatrist understanding and possibly add new material. Then education. At times in, this, in the interview, it is helpful for the psychiatrist to educate also the patient about the interview process. Then reassurance. So for example, an accurate information about the usual course of an illness can decrease anxiety, encourage the patient to continue to discuss his or her illness, and strengthen his or her, to resolve, her resolve to continue in the treatment. So it is helpful to provide this reassurance for this type of patients. And then encouragement. It is difficult for many patients to come for psychiatric evaluation. Of often, they are uncertain as to what will happen and receiving encouragement can facilitate their engagement. Then acknowledgement of emotion. So the interviewer needs to acknowledge the expression of the patient's emotion. Then humor. At times, the patient may make a humorous comment or tell a brief joke. So it can be beneficial if the psychiatrist will smile, laugh, or even when appropriate, add another punchline. So this sharing of humor can decrease the patient's tension and anxiety and can also reinforce the patient's the, or the interviewer's genuineness. And then silence. Careful use of silence can facilitate the progression of the interview. So sometimes the patient may need time to think about what has been said or experience or to experience a feeling that has arising arise arising in the interview then nonverbal communication such as nodding of the head leaning forward body positioning that is becoming more op open moving the chair closer to the patient putting down one pen and also to listen attentively then um next will be expanding interventions so this is when the interviewer wants to encourage the patient to talk more about other issues. So one may use clarifying intervention. So at times, carefully clarifying what the patient has been said can lead to unrecognized issues or psychopathology. Then associations. Other areas that are related to a symptom should be explored. So for example, the symptom of nausea leads to questions about the appetite the bowel habits, the weight loss, and also the eating habits. Then the leading. So often, continuing the story can be facilitated by asking what, when, where, or who question. And then probing. So the interview may point toward an area of conflict, but the patient may minimize or deny any possibilities. So gently encourage the patient to talk more about this issue may be quite productive. And then transition. So transition means moving to a different area of the interview and a bridge statement is also useful. Then redirecting. This is often crucial to a successful interview because of the time constraints. But redirection can be used when the patient changes the topic or when the patient continues to focus on a non-productive or a well-covered area. Moving on to obstructive interventions. Although supportive and expanding techniques facilitate gathering of information and development of a positive patient-doctor relationship, several other interventions are not helpful for either task. So the use of close-ended questions. 
a series of close-ended questions early in the interview can retard the natural flow of the patient's history. Over time, psychiatrists, especially if they, ha they have had the benefit of supervision, they learn from patients and then refine their interviewing skills. Then using compound questions. Some questions are difficult for patients to respond because more than one question is being asked. Then using the why questions, especially if early on in the interview, um, the interviewer will already ask why. These are often non-productive. Very often, the answer to that question is one of the reasons that the patient has sought help. Then using judgmental questions or statements. This would inhibit the patient from sharing even more private or sensitive material. It would be better for the psychiatrist to help the patient reflect on how successful that behavior was. Then minimizing the patient's concern. In attempt to reassure the patients, psychiatrists sometimes make the error of minimizing a concern. This can be counterproductive in that rather than being reassured, the patient may feel that the psychiatrist does not understand what he or she is trying to express. And then premature advice. Advice given too early is often bad advice because the interviewer does not yet know all the patient or all the variables during the interview. And then premature interpretation. Even if it's accurate, a premature interven interpretation can be counterproductive as the patient may respond defensively and feel misunderstood. And then transition that are too abrupt may interrupt essential issues that the patient is discussing. And then nonverbal communication. It's when the psychiatrist repeatedly looks at the watch and then turns away from the patient, yawns, um, conveys boredom, disinterest, or annoyance. So how to interview difficult patients? When dealing with patients with psychosis, uh, they are often frightened and guarded, difficulty with reasoning, and are actively hallucinating. So one may need to alter the usual format and adapt to match the capacity and tolerance of the patients. When patients had um, auditory hallucinations, we may ask for the content of these hallucinations, the clarity, if it's commanding or not. So it uh, it is also helpful for the patient to ask about the specific instance and if he or she can repeat verbatim the content of hallucinations. And also if he or she has ever experienced the, the, uh, that commanding um, hallucinations or voices because it may harm himself or herself or to others. And if this patient is compelled to follow that command. The validity of the patient's perception should also not be dismissed. But it seems uh, to be helpful to test for the strength of the belief in the hallucinations. So for example, question like, does it seem that the voices are coming from inside your head? So who do you think it uh, who do you think is speaking to you? Although an interviewer should not directly endorse the false belief, it is really helpful to challenge the delusion, particularly in the initial examination directly. It can be useful to shift the attention back to the patients rather than the examiner's belief and acknowledge the need for more information. So like, um, I believe that what you are experiencing is frightening and I would like to know more about your experiences. So for patients with paranoid thoughts and behavior, it is important to maintain a respectful distance. For patients with depressed and potentially suicidal, these patients may have particularly difficult may have particular difficulty during the interview as he or she may have cognitive benefits as a result of the depressive symptoms. So the patients may have impaired motivation and may not spontaneously report their symptoms. So we may need to, uh, to have a more direct questioning rather than an open-ended format. So we also want to assess for the suicidality of the patient. 
to ask for a current thoughts of suicide and also the intention. So in assessing for the attempt, one must be specific enough to ask for his or her plan and the means to complete the, the plan or the attempt. So if not acted, ask what has prevented, prevented him because it's essential to keep in mind during treatment if this preventive act these preventive factors change. We should also assess for the psychotic symptoms since hallucinations will have commanding voices that would compel them or them to hurt themselves or to others. Moving on to patients who is hostile, agitated, and potentially violent patients. So priority for this type of patients are the safety for the psychiatrist and also for the patient itself. So um, hostile patients are most often interviewed in an emergency settings, while angry and agitated patients can be found in any part of the setting. Chair placement must also have a specific arrangement. So it is placed in a way in which the both it, in which both the interviewer and patient could exit if necessary and not be obstructed. So approach the patient or the interview in a calm, direct manner and take care not to bargain or promise to elicit corp in order to elicit um, cooperation. Unpremeditated violence is preceded by a period of gradually escalating psychomotor agitation such as pacing, loud, loud speech, and threatening comments. So one must already ask for an assistance or medication or restraint. And then for deceptive patients. So uh, we should gather collateral information regarding the patient. So if noted with discrepancies or inconsistencies, we can suggest or we may already have a clue that it is already a deception and not, um, not the right information about the patient. Moving on to the physical examination of a psychiatric patient. Two recent issues have pushed medical assessment and laboratory testing in psychiatric patients to the, for to the forefront of attention for most clinicians. The it is the widespread recognition of the pervasive problems of metabolic syndrome in clinical psychiatry and the shorter life expectancy of psychiatric patients compared with that of the general population. And so monitoring the physical health of psychiatric patients has two goals. One is to provide for an appropriate care for existing illness and also to protect the patient's current health from possible future impairment due to the effects of the psycho, um, psychotropic medications. An important part of the examination which falls under general observation would use visual, auditory, and also olfactory senses. First off is the visual inspection. So one must assess for the gait since uh, patients who was ataxia can also have a diffuse brain disease, alcohol or other substance intoxication, spinal cerebellar degeneration, weakness that is based on a debilitating process or a myotropic myotonic dystrophy. A Parkinsonian gait doesn't necessarily mean that the patient already has Parkinson's disease but it can also be because of the antipsychotic medications he or she is taking. So a Parkinsonian gait is described as a walk without the usual associated arm movements and turn in a rigid fashion. If, one, uh, if we can note for an asymmetric gait, dragging leg or swinging one arm, we can also um, have a clue that the patient has a focal brain lesion. So we can refer it to the um, to the medical department for further evaluation before we accept it as a psychiatric uh, management or psychiatric patient. Then for the grooming, an inappropriately dressed and hygienic patient does not necessarily mean that he or she is already psychotic, but it can also be a hallmark of a positive um, cognitive disorder. And then posture and automatic movements. So like I've said, Parkinson's disease, cere diffuse cere cerebellar hemispheric disease, and also an adverse effect of antipsychotics can also present with 
an abnormal posture or automatic movements. Avoiding eye contact is also common in psychiatric um, patients, but that doesn't mean that he or she is already psychotic. You can also consider diplopia, visual field defect, focal cerebellar dis and, and also focal cerebellar dysfunction. And a quick purposeless movements can also be a anxiety disorders, but, a but can also be a medical such as chorea or hyperthyroidism. So the appearance such as weight loss can also be, I can also suggest specific disease, not only just because of the patient again is psychotic. So we, one must rule out first a medical condition or somatic condition and also for the nutritional status whether he or she has recent weight loss or obesity because again we've learned, uh, we all know that a recent weight loss can also be a cause of um, cancer or a malignancy then we should inspect also for the face and also the head so in a pernicious an anemia, there is a premature whitening of the hair. So in opiate use or intoxication, we can also note for a pupillary constriction. While in anticholinergic agents and hallucinogen intoxication, there is a pupillary dilatation. And atropine-like toxicity can have both dilated and fixed pupils, as well as a dry skin and mucous membrane. Bell's palsy can also present with and a facial asymmetry. So for the skin, um, very common, jaundice for hepatic disease, rather if it's anemic, intense reddening can have, uh, can be because of carbon monoxide poisoning, SLE or porphyria. And also for telangiectasia can be a cause of, or can be a presentation of alcohol abuse. For alertness and responsiveness, if the patient is seen to be drowsy and inattentive, we can also rule in an organic brain dysfunction but can also be a psychological problem. Then for the second, uh, the second thing to consider in a general observation is the listening. So when the patient has slowed speech, we can be, uh, we can also rule in depression but diffuse brain dysfunction cannot and can also be considered as well as a subcortical dysfunction. An unusually rapid speed doesn't mean that the patient is already manic, but it can also be um, a presentation of a patient who has anxiety or hyperthyroidism. A patient who has a weak voice with monotonous tone can be a patient who has Parkinson's disease, complaining mainly of depression. A slow and low-pitched and hoarse voice can also be because of hypothyroidism. When the patient has difficulty initiating a speech, we can also consider aphasia and also Parkinson's disease. An easy fatigability of the speech can be an emotional problem or a myasthenia gravis. And then paraphasia can have um, a lesion in the dominant sphere. Then for the smell, um, if patient has an unpleasant odor, we cannot just um, be judgmental enough to, to say that the patient has doesn't take uh, does, is a psychotic and doesn't want or has a poor self care. But it could also be a cognitive or depressive disorder because there is a failure for him to take a bath or doesn't have that energy to take a bath. An odor of alcohol or substance can be attributed to a drinking problem. A uriniferous odor can be because of a blood dysfunction, secondary to um, nervous system disease. Characteristic odors such as diabetic ketoacidosis, flatulence, uremia, and hepatic coma can have that specific odor. A smell of an adult sweat, especially if the patient is pediatric or a child, can be considered or can be uh, ruled in uh, to have a precocious puberty because of of a mature apocrine glands. The nature of the patient's complaints is critical in determining whether a complete PE is required. 
And these complaints may fall into three categories, the body, the mind, and social interactions. So when presenting with a patient who has headaches or palpitation, we can call already for um, a thorough, or we can suggest for a thorough medical examination. If the patient is depressed, anxious, has hallucinations and persecutory delusions, so uh, we can uh, we can assess accordingly if the patient has an impending somatic disorder. In social interaction, example, if the patient if, uh, if there is a long-standing difficulties in interactions with teachers, employers, patients, or a spouse, it may be no particular indication for a physical examination. So, in conducting physical examination in a psychiatric patient or in a psychiatric setting, one must take note of a possible psychological factors. So first is that it can intensify a reaction of anxiety. So even a routine physical examination may evoke adverse reactions. So like the instruments, the procedures, and the examining room may be frightening for some patients. So a simple, so what can be what can we do to address this um, anxiousness or psychological factors is that to have a simple running account of what is being done that can prevent much um, that can prevent much of that anxiety. So it can also stir up sexual feelings. So some women with fears or fantasies of being seduced may, mis may misinterpret an ordinary movement in the physical examination as a sexual advances. So similarly, a delusional man with homophobic fears may perceive a rectal examination as a sexual attack. But it can also serve as a psychotherapeutic function. Um, it can also develop false and fixed belief that a disorder is present. An observant physician may also may note um, indications of emotional emotional distress during PE, during physical examination. So in in patients or in in instance that it may develop a false fixed belief that a disorder is present. It's when uh, after we do physical examination, we may say to the patient to just wait for, um, for the possible result or we may ask you or we contact you if what, uh, what the physical examination is, uh, what has been concluded with the physical examination. So an anxious patient may believe that he or she is having a malignant disorder, is already having a serious disorder because they uh, because we ask them to take long or we ask them to wait for the possible result of that examination. And then for the timing, there are circumstances that make it desirable or necessary to defer a complete medical assessment. So for example, a delusional or manic patient may be combative or system or boom. So these uh, medical history can be elicited from a family member if not for the patient itself or if not from the patient itself. And then for the neurologic exam, it is indicated when cognitive disorder is suspected. Unlike with underlying somatic disorders such as diabetes mellitus, where referral is made. So uh, what can what can be uh, what to note during the history taking? So the level of awareness, the attentiveness to the details of examination, the understanding, the facial expression, the speech, the posture, and also for the gait. There are two objectives for a, for a neurologic examination. First is to elicit signs pointing to a focal or circumscribed cerebral dysfunction. And this is met by a routine neurologic exam. Another objective is to elicit signs for that suggests for a diffuse and bilateral cerebellar disease. This is through signs attributed to a diffuse brain dysfunction and to a frontal lobe disease, such as a socking, the snout, palmo, ventral, the grass reflex, persistence of the glabellal top response. So this is just a run through of the basic neurologic exam the mental status, the cranial nerves, the motor reflexes, and also for the sensations. This is just a brief review of what the test during 
uh, what to test or what to do when eliciting or when uh, we want to know if the cranial nerve is intact or not. Also for the grading system of the motor, the sensations, and also for the reflexes. Then moving on to the laboratory tests in psychiatry. So there are two goals for monitoring for the physical health. That is to provide for an appropriate care that ex uh, appro provide appropriate care for an existing illness and also to protect for the patient's current health status from a possible future impairment due to the antipsychotic medications. So these are just the common laboratory workups done in our, um, in our institution. CBC, urinalysis, SGPTS, GOT, sodium potassium, and other electrolytes, creatinine, FBS, lipid profile, thyroid, thyroid panel, chest x-ray, 12 bit ECG, drug test, and RT-PCR. So we all know that the test for the CBC is just to rule out for the infection and also to have a baseline differential count since most of our antipsychotics will have effect on the WBC such as your clozapine. We can also, uh, it is also helpful for, for patients who's an IV drug user because they are at risk most of, mostly of bacterial infection due to the use of contaminated needles. And then for urinalysis, again, it's to rule out another infection. Special example is UTI and also for the STD. And also for the test for the renal function. Because some psychiatric illnesses such as manic or mania and substance disorder are, high, are higher risk for STDs. SGPT and SGOT is the test for the liver function, if it's alcohol-induced or not. Um, the lung, kidney, heart, skeletal muscles, and other psychiatric medicines that can elevate and give birth, or that can elevate or has an effect in our liver. So electrolytes, there are it is abnormal in delirium, psychotropic there are psychotropic medications, and also for vomiting as well as psychogenic um, polydipsia. There are also medications that could cause. Uh, Electrolyte imbalance, example, is carbamazepine, which can cause hyponatremia. A low calcium can also be seen in depression, delirium, irritability, laxative use, and also for eating disorder. And then creatinine or also um, blood urea nitrogen. This is also useful if we are having or we want to test for the uh, clearance of the lithium because it can have an effect in our renal, our renal function. Then fasting blood sugar, because our atypical antipsychotics can cause insulin resistance due to its cardiometabolic actions, as well as the lipid profile, because it can also cause dyslipidemia. And then thyroid function, TSH and free T4, because thyroid disease, commonly associated with depression and anxiety can also cause or can also manifest with a panic disorder or panic symptoms, dementia, and also for psychosis. And just X-ray, uh, aside from ruling in or ruling out a possible um, lung infection, it can also be useful to test for a cardiomegaly because of our antipsychotic, a typical antipsychotics, again, has a cardiometabolic effect. And 12 with ECG, and that because we want to assess for a possible side effects of the psychotropic medications. Example, the QT prolongation of your um, tricyclic antidepressants and also for the ziprasidone, and also a T wave changes in lithium therapy. And of course, RT PCR to rule out COVID infection. Moving on to toxicology studies, there are drug-induced mental disorder that could resemble primary psychiatric problem and that could exacerbate a pre-existing mental illness. So urine drugs of abuse screens are immunoassays that could detect barbiturates, benzodiazepines, cocaine, opiates, phenylcyclidine, tetrahydrocannabinol, tricyclic antidepressants. And these rapid tests will provide results within an hour. However, if the screening test uh, is positive, 
there are additional tests that it requires to confirm their to confirm their screening results. So most of these tests are performed on a urine samples. These urine screens provide for the information of the recent use of frequently abused drugs such as the alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, marijuana, opiates, and so on. But there are substances that could produce false positive. And if there is false positive, we should also have a confirmatory test, test that should be requested. So for drug abuse, patients are frequently unreliable when reporting their drug abuse history. Drug-induced mental disorder, again, can resemble primary psychiatric disorders. There are, uh, there are indications for ordering a drug abuse screen. This includes unexplained behavioral symptoms, a history of illicit drug use or dependence in a new, pa new patient evaluation, or a high-risk background. Example, if the patient has criminal record, um, adolescents, and also a prostitute. We could also monitor for the patient's abstinence during treatment of substance abuse. And these tests can be ordered on a scheduled or random basis. Now, there are laboratory data that may suggest a problem with a substance use disorder. So, an increase in the MCV or the mean corpuscular volume is associated with alcohol use disorder as well as the liver enzymes. So uh, there are serologic tests also for hep B or hep C that could confirm that diagnosis if that liver uh, or that elevated liver enzymes is not because of a possible alcohol use disorder, but maybe because of an IV drug use, a dr IV drug abuse. So again, as I've said, the IV drug user is at risk of bacterial endocarditis. And what, as what I've mentioned, there are also false positive and also false negative for such laboratory results. If the if the result has a false positive, we can consider that there is an interaction with the prescribed medication. And uh, in an instance, in an instance, if the uh, if the result has a false negative, we can also consider a problem with the collection and also for the storage. So this is a table lifted from Kaplan that shows us the length of time detected in the urine in the respective drug. Example, alcohol. So it can be detected in the urine for about 7 to 12 hours. Amphetamine, 48 to 72 hours. Um, barbiturates, if it's a long, if a short acting, a 24 hour duration. If it's long acting, 3 weeks. So benzodiazepine, 3 days. Cocaine, uh, it can already be detected in 68 hours, codeine, 48 hours, heroin, 36 to 72 hours, uh, marijuana, 2 to 7 days, morphine, 48 to 72 hours, and so on. But in our institution, what we've mostly seen is, uh, or encounter is the alcohol and the amphetamine use. So, um, for alcohol, we can expect that to be positive in less than 12 hours in amphetamine, less than three days. So for alcohol use disorder, unfortunately, there is no single test or finding on physical examination that is diagnostic for alcohol use disorder. So the history of the pattern of alcohol ingestion is the most important in making such diagnosis. So if uh, we have encountered that the patient has rhinophyma or plastilangiectasia as well as hepatomegaly and also evidence of trauma, so we can conclude also or we can infer uh, that the patient has an alcohol use, a possible alcohol use disorder. However, there are um, there are still laboratory results that could indicate a possible or that could be a possible evidence of an alcohol use uh, abuse. So an abal or a blood alcohol level can be used to confirm such intoxication. 
So a high blood alcohol level in a patient who doesn't show any significant intoxication is consistent with tolerance. But a low blood alcohol level but with evidence of intoxication may suggest that this intoxication is because of an additional agent and not because of alcohol. Intoxication is commonly found in levels between 100 to 300 milligrams per dl. And this degree of alcohol intoxication can also be assessed using a concentration of alcohol in expired respirations using a breath breathalyzer. We can also uh, request for SGPT and SGOT or AST and ALT. So a ratio of 2 is to 1 in where in AST is greater than ALT may suggest an, a chronic alcohol use. So if, we're, if we encounter this, if we have um, forget that we're, uh, whether if it's AST or ALT is elevated in chronic use, just remember that a, um, the S in AST is uh, uh, we can uh, we can uh, we can remember the S in AST as sunniglite. So AST is for alcohol use, and also we can uh, we can also conclude or it is also one of the evidence if there is an elevated bilirubin protein. GGT, a low um, total protein, albumin, and also a macrocytic anemia. Moving on to environmental toxins. An aluminum intoxication may cause dementia-like condition, and this can be detected in the urine or the blood. Arsenic intoxication may cause fatigue, loss of consciousness, anemia, and hair loss. And this can be detected in the urine, blood, and also for the hair. Manganese intoxication may present with delirium, confusion, and Parkinsonian syndrome. And this can be detected in the urine, blood, and also for the hair. Mercury includes apathy, poor memory, labile, headache, fatigue, and can be detected in the urine, blood, and also for the hair. And the lead intoxication includes encephalopathy, irritability, apathy, anorexia, and can be detected in the blood and the urine. For volatile substances, these produce vapors that are inhaled for their psychoactive effects. Most commonly abused volatile solvents are gasoline, glue, painter, paint thinner, correction fluid, cleaning sprays, deodorant sprays, um, whipped cream containers, nitrites, butyl nitrites vials, anesthetic gases such as chloroform and ether, and also for the nitrous gas. So it's, it has an effect or a chronic abuse of these solvents is associated with the brain damage, liver, kidney, lung, heart, bone marrow, and blood problem. And signs of abuse may include shorter memory loss, cognitive impairments, slurred speech, um, scanning speech, and tremor, and also for cardiac arrhythmias. Moving on to zero medication concentrations. So acetaminophen is one of the mostly um, abused drug and it could cause hepatic necrosis. Toxicity is associated with levels greater than 140 micrograms per liter per ml at four hours from ingestion in patients without pre-existing liver disease. An antidote for this is acetylcysteine or what we've known as, or what it is marketed as flumosil. Then salicylate toxicity example is aspirin, an ingestion of 500 mg per kilo may be fatal. And concentration of aspirin or salicylate of more than 40 mg per dl could have any possible symptoms of toxicity that includes an acid-base abnormality, stachypnea, tinnitus, nausea, and vomiting. Then clozapine, at least 350 mg of clozapine is considered to be uh, to have uh, to achieve therapeutic response in refractory schizophrenia and the likelihood of seizures and other side effects is increased if it's greater than 1200 or doses even greater than 600. Carbamazepine could cause anemia, aplastic anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia and also hyponatremia, spina bifida and other anomalies. 
manifestation of its toxicity may include nausea, vomiting, urinary ten- retention, ataxia, confusion, drowsiness, agitation, or nystagmus. Lithium has a neurotherapeutic index unlike haloperidol, and its symptoms of toxicity may begin at levels greater than 1.2 max or or even uh, levels greater than 1.4. And then valproate has a risk of hepatotoxicity, congenital disabilities, as well as hematologic abnormalities. And then now inhibitors could cause orthostasis and hypertensive crises. Occasionally, hepatotoxicity. And then tricyclic and tetracyclic antidepressants could have an effect in cardiac induction. And then uh, the neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is a fatal side effects of your antipsychotic medications, it it is it consists of autonomic instability, hyperparexia, severe EPS, and delirium. Hyperparexia, uh, myoglobinuria, and leukocytosis are common, as well as hepatic and renal failure. So the treatment of this includes discontinuation of neuroleptic. A neuroleptic medications, hydration, and administration of muscle relaxants, as well as general supportive nursing care. So, a WBC count of 10,000 to 40,000 per millimeter uh, cubic millimeter is already indicative of possible NMS. And then, moving on to the imaging of the CNS, when we request for an MRI, it is used to distinguish between structural brain abnormalities that is associated with patients' behavioral changes. It is also useful in examining for patients' particular diseases. CT scan is also used to identify structural brain abnormalities, but we could also look for the evidence of stroke, subdural hematoma, tumor, or abscess when using CT scan. PET scan is useful in the, in the differential diagnosis of dementing disease. Other imaging used are single photon uh, emission CT, functional MRI that is used to measure regional cerebral blood flow, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and angiography. Now let's move on to the psychiatric rating skills. So the term psychiatric rating skills encompasses a variety of questionnaires, interviews, checklists, outcome assessments, and other instruments that are available to inform psychiatric practice, research, and administration. The benefit of this is to standardize the information collected across time and also to establish a baseline for follow-up of the progression of an illness. These are just the... So I will just run through the, uh, the different rating skills used in psychiatry. So when we want to assess for the disability, we can use the HODAS 2.0 or the WHO Disability Assessment Schedule, the SCID or the Structured Clinical Interview for DSM can be used for psychiatric diagnosis. For psychotic disorders, we could use the Brief Psychiatric Rating Scale, the PANS or the Positive and Negative Syndrome Scale, the SAPS and SANS, or the scale for the assessment of a positive and a negative symptoms, respectively. Then for mood symptoms, we could use the HAMD or the, and the BDI. HAMD refers to the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression and Beck Depression Inventory. For anxiety disorders, uh, we could use the HAMA or the Hamilton Anxiety Rating Scale the Panic Disorder Severity Scale, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, and the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. For substance abuse, we can ask uh, the CAGE. Uh, it's a mnemonic for C, cut down. So have you ever felt that you should cut down on your drinking? Um, a, if it's, uh, it stands for how many, or how have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking? G for guilt, have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking? And E as an eye opener, so have you ever had a drink first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or to get rid of hangover? And then as well, and also uh, aside from cage, we could use an addiction severity index. Then for eating disorders, 
we can use the scale eating disorders examination and the bulimia test revised. And then lastly, for cognitive disorders, we could use the MMSE or the Mini Mental State Examination, the NPI or the Neuropsychiatric Inventory, the SGIT or the Scored General Intelligence Test. For personal disorders and personality tests, we could use the PDQ or the Personality Disorder Questionnaire. For childhood disorders, we could also use the Child Behavior Checklist, Diagnostic Interview Schedule for Children, the Connors Rating Scales, the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revised. That would be all for Chapter 1.1. Thank you for listening and have a great day. Hey.